Helen Sweeney, I'm the Education Specialist here at the National Archives in Fort Worth, and we appreciate everybody coming. I just wanted to make an announcement if everybody could um, turn their ringers on their cell phones off, um, that would be great. And um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have Dr. Rebecca Sharpless here who teaches at TCU, uh, obviously just down the road. Um, she, however, was at Baylor University, go Lady Bears, congratulations to them for winning last night, so I didn't know at TCU now, but... Um, <laughs> So she was the director of the Institute for Oral History there for about 13 years, and then she came to TCU in 2006, and she teaches a variety of courses, um, mainly U.S. history, a seminar in oral history, um, history of working people in America, and the history of food in America, history of American women, and also an introduction to women's studies, the United States and the world, as well as Texas history. She's written many publications, um, several books, her latest being Cooking in Other Women's Kitchens, Domestic Workers in the South, 1865 through 1960, and then Fertile Ground, Narrow Choices, Women on Texas Cotton Farms from 1900 to 1940, which won several awards um, from the Texas State Historical Association, and it is a wonderful book. I had the pleasure of reading it while I was in graduate school. So. Um, uh, she also has numerous articles and is a member of a variety of professional organizations. So if you guys will um, like to welcome Dr. Sharpless, um, we're happy you're here. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, when Meg and I were, Meg Hacker and I were corresponding about this talk, uh, we decided to call it America on the Cusp because people were like, oh, 1940. Well, 1940 is not really the beginning of the 40s, it's really the end of the 30s. And so what I want to talk about today is it's right wedged in there between those two cataclysmic events of the Great Depression and World War II, which sort of blended into each other. Uh, but I found, found this great Norman Rockwell drawing from the Saturday Evening Post taken about the time of the 1940 census. Um, and I think it's actually a little bit racist, but toward the, I think it's racist toward the Irish with the red hair, but they have the woman with six kids counting up on her fingers to tell the census taker how many children she has, and the news looking census taker with his big book, and his overcoat, and don't we all wish that he's riding carefully and allegedly <laughs> in very dark ink? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I use the census a lot, and, and you know, God bless the census takers who write legend. <laughs> um, but anyway, so 1940 is really a very interesting year. Uh, and one of my favorite things about the National Archives and the Farm Security Administration Office of War Information Photos, they digitize, the folks in Washington have digitized 60,000 images that were taken in the 30s. And just to give you an idea of you know, how much in transit things were at this point, you've got big railroads out at Big Spring and still plowing with mules in Williamson County. So the technology is still very much in flux at this point. And then the girl rodeo performer at San Angelo. Now the girl rodeos don't really come into full play until World War II. But she looks like she's somebody to be reckoned with. She looks like she knows her way around a corral. So these are just a sampling, and, and they're so easy. If you don't know this collection, you ought to take a look at it. It's so easy because all you have to do is put in 1940 in Texas. Boom. Up they come. These are all taken by Russell Lee, um, <coughs> who spent a lot of time hanging out in Texas and took a lot of really terrific pictures. Still very much the end of the Great Depression. You do it? Whoa, Gunner. Is that good? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. It is the end of the 30s. And you can see that unemployment peaked in 1933 and fell and came back up. So in 1940, unemployment is still 14% still a lot of people who are not doing 
great around the country. And a lot of the New Deal programs were still in effect. The Works Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, you know, name your alphabet soup relief agency. They're still up and running in 1940 because the Depression is not over. So Russell Lee managed to make it out to Menard County and take pictures of these guys working on working on the roads. Good public works and public works project with these images. <coughs> And yet one more evidence of the fact that the country is not recovering. The birth rate is still very low. And I love, I, I love teaching this to my undergraduates. Um, population plummets in the 20s partially because of birth control, but then it goes down, down to a really low level in the 30s because people are waiting to have their babies. Want to don't want to um, risk it. Then this these are called the goodbye babies. These are the, the children that were born during World War II as their dads were going off to war. Then it goes down. Then it starts. The baby boom starts and it peaks. 1957. I'm right there. <laughs> and, um, no, I'm and then there. and then birth control. The pill comes in and it goes down and starts going down to breaks not seen since the 1930s. But this, this decline in births and the decline in immigration, people don't come to the United States because there's nothing for them to do once they get here. So the, the, the 1930s remain the period of the least growth in the United States and throughout since they started doing the census in 1790. <clears throat> Only 7.3%. If we think of the 40s, we think of World War II, and this is why I call it America on the Cusp, because the United States was really tiptoeing up. Foreign policy had to be on people's minds. It was just out there, absolutely looming, but the U.S. was not committed to the war yet. Okay. 1940, it's still, I mean, if you, I, I would imagine that most thinking people in the United States thought it was inevitable. The United States was not actively involved in the war until the end of 1941, um, so a year and a half, a full year and a half after the census is done. And things have been deteriorating for a long time, particularly well, in both Europe and in the Pacific. Uh, the first involvement of, the, of Americans really in this situation is during the Spanish Civil War, 1936. Um, Germany helps the fascist side, the Soviet Union helps the Republican side. The United States official stance is neutrality and says we're not going to send arms, but a lot of American volunteers such as Ernest Hemingway go over to help the Republican side. So there are Americans actively involved in the Spanish Civil War as early as 1936, taking sides against the Germans, against fascism, as volunteers. In 1936, Germany is beginning to push out in all directions. Now, Hitler takes, takes power in 1933, by the way, in case you don't have that day screwed into your memory. Hitler took power in 1933. Um, they start to push out, and this is the start of the appeasement process in which France and Germany are like, okay, you can have the Rhineland, just don't go any further. Yeah. And, we know, and we all know how effective that was. But as little as you think about it, this is only 18 years after the conclusion of World War I. And it's really not hard to understand why the Europeans were not eager to get into another bloodbath. It had been less than a generation. So they're trying to come to grips with this, and as we know, it doesn't turn out so well. 1938, Kristallnacht, when the Nazis destroy German synagogues, homes, businesses. Um, it's really first awakening to a lot of people of just how brutal the Nazi regime was going to be 
and the United States pulled its ambassador to Germany after Kristallnacht. But there's still this ambivalence, this unwillingness to get involved. Um, a ship called the St. Louis left Germany with 940 pass Jewish passengers looking for asylum somewhere in the New World. And they were turned away in Cuba. They were turned away in Florida. They were turned away in Canada. They had to go back to Europe. And it's estimated that about, about a third of those people died. And the United States was not willing the United States had a very, very rigid immigration policy that was put in after World War I. And they were not willing to bend that policy to let these Jewish refugees in. So a lot of ambivalence about all this. And of course, um, the United States does not know clearly what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on in Germany with the concentration camps till, oh, maybe 1944 when they find out they're truly horrified. So maybe cut the U.S. a little slack on that, but clearly not seeing the big picture on this. Okay, 1940, Germany is romping and stomping. They invade, I have the low countries on here, so that's you know, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, also Norway and Denmark. They're all taken over by the Nazis in the early summer of 1940. France falls in June. So Germany has control of the entire continent by June of 1940. And that just leaves Little England separated by that strait of water, the English Channel. And summer and fall of 1940 begins the Battle of Britain with frequent heavy bombing of Britain, and Britain does not fall. That is the key to a lot of that happens in World War II, is that Britain manages to not to resist being taken over by the Nazis. And Americans are watching all this. You know, they're paying attention. It must have been just horrifying to see the whole continent under the rule of Germany and Italy in parts of North Africa as well. Um, Winston Churchill takes over from Neville Chamberlain as Prime Minister in late 1940. And, and you know, he's half American. His mom was Jenny Randolph. Um, and he is Time Magazine's Man of the Year for 1940. And those ties would be close. Now, in terms of Japan, not so pressing to the United States. The Pacific is a very big ocean. And it's a lot easier to, to not think about it. But the United States is aware there's been some movement toward trying to get the Japanese to be less aggressive, but they aren't really moving out. And, um, and Japan really continued to expand on into 1942. That's when they took over most of the islands. But uh, at this point in 1940, most of their focus is still in China. And they are still, um, if you look at this map, everything but the dark purple was already in Japanese hands by 1940. So it's very clearly an aggression um, that has to be paid attention to. All right, in September of 1940, Japan, Germany, and Italy form the tripartite or Axis powers. They sign a treaty for their mutual, uh, I was reading the treaty earlier, is, you know, basically saying they're all working together, which is, of course, what a treaty does, but it has some really kind of cynical language in there about a new, a new order in the world and that they wanted to establish and maintain this new order. So they would work together very closely. This is the Japanese foreign minister, obviously, shaking hands with Hitler. And then this is a propaganda poster from Japan at about this point with all the happy children, the Italian, Japanese, and German children all dancing together under their national flags. So it's going to be great. 
again, to anybody who's paying attention in the United States, this had to be just terrifying to see these three powers coming together. But the United States is not at war. Europe is at war. Japan is at war with China. Britain is getting bombed to smithereens. But the United States can't get over that hump of getting involved. So they, they do some, not diversionary tactics, but I guess you call them halfway measures. The Lend-Lease program is like, oh, come on, you really think nobody's seeing through this? We're not selling arms to the Europeans. We're loaning them to them, like they're going to come back in great shape. <laughs> uh, but it's a way of getting, getting arms to the Europeans to fight the Germans and the Italians. So that starts in March of 1940. At the end of 1940, First peacetime draft in American history starts. 16 million men registered for the draft at that point. And um, so that had to get people's attention. When you, start, when you start drafting people's sons and brothers and husbands, and you know that, that things are getting pretty serious. And I thought this was interesting. When I hear about the fireside chats that Franklin Roosevelt made as president, I always think well, that he must have done it all the time. Well, no, he made two fireside chats in 1940, and only two. And they were both on the topic of foreign policy. One on national defense, the need to have a strong defense against attack. And the arsenal of democracy helping the other countries um, with the American resources. So people have to be paying attention great photo of somebody actually, they're, they're supposed to be listening to a fire sound chat. They're actually <coughs> or not. So, tippy telling up, but again, I'll remind you, the United States does not go to war for a full year after this, not till the end of 1941. So, um, the Allies have to, have to go on without the United States and all, and all that it brought to the table during the war for another year. Okay. <clears throat> Franklin Roosevelt runs for an unprecedented third term and wins overwhelmingly over Wendell Wilkie. And I was talking to, um, to Kent Stevens, our presidential scholar at TCU, and I said, why did Roosevelt run for a third term? And he said, well, Things were very unstable. The economy was still not on track. We got all this foreign policy stuff going, and he said, and Roosevelt was not a great admirer of precedent. So nobody had ever been president for three terms before. Well, that was no reason to stop him. So, um, and he was nominated with overwhelming approbation, and he was elected with overwhelming approbation. So the people of the United States did not have a serious problem with electing Roosevelt for a third term that we have, that when we look back on it. Um, and I, I'll remind you, he was actually elected to a fourth term in 1944 and died only a couple of months into that term. And he was hardly cold in the grave when the, when the amendment to limit presidents to two terms was introduced. So he is our only, only president to serve more than two terms. But so you've got that continuity of Roosevelt staying on as president. Socially, a lot of it's same old, same old. Uh, South in particular is still heavily segregated racially. Uh, you see the colored waiting room in Durham, North Carolina. This is an FSA photograph. But things are just beginning to shift. I mean, they're just beginning to shift, particularly because of this man, A. Philip Randolph. He was a union leader, the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And he and other people were really beginning to put pressure on the Roosevelt administration about racial prejudice, about inequality. And it's because of the actions of A. Philip Randolph and his cohorts 
that the United States gets its first Equal Pay Act during World War II. So there's, uh, like I said, it's just little tiny cracks beginning to appear. And of course, segregation will be the law of the land for another 25 years until the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of women, there's not a great deal to say about changes in the status of women during the 1930s. A lot of it had to do with economics and just sort of holding on. It's not, I mean, there's some big firsts, like Frances Perkins being the first woman to hold a cabinet level position. She was a secretary of um, labor. But, and, and then there's my hero, Eleanor Roosevelt, who's out romping and stomping, uh, really a very vital public presence, but in terms of the day-to-day -day life of the average American woman, she's just trying to, trying to get by through these rough economic times. Now, in terms of, of culture, both high and low, in terms of, of, of what we've talked about, um, symphonic music, there's there are a few um, high points in the United States in 1940. Uh, Aaron Copeland is composing, uh, but a lot of it's in Eastern Europe, Stravinsky, um, a couple of others. In terms of the visual arts, this looks like I'm, I'm not very, I am not well trained in the visual arts, but to me these look like the same things that O'Keefe and, and Edward Hopper were doing in the 20s. And there's a major exhibit over at the DMA right now in Dallas. Um, on art in the 20s, and I'm eager to get over there and see it. But Georgia O'Keeffe with her flower series, a lot of these, Pet Mallon, Victoria, the New Mexico landscape that she loves so much with the flower superimposed on it. I see a lot of works like that from O'Keeffe. And then Edward Hopper's Guest, uh, it's a mobile station with the pumps all rigidly lined up. It's all you know, right angles and hard lines, just like other Edward Hopper paintings. So there are things going on in the fine arts, but no dramatic shifts. I think. And I looked at architecture a little bit. Not surprisingly, there's not a lot going on in architecture in 1940 because there's not a lot of money to build stuff in the 1940s. So no real landmarks. And you know, in the 30s, you get Rockefeller Center and the Empire State Building. Um, I think the Golden Age Ridge was built in the 30s, but but by 1940. In terms of popular culture, there's a lot of fun stuff. Sports go on in a lot of ways. The Reds and the Tigers go to the World Series, full seven games, Cincinnati wins. Chicago Bears beat the Redskins for the NFL championship, and I love the Super Bowl back then. A&M and SMU tied for the Southwest Conference Football Championship, but because A&M had beaten SMU, A&M went to the Cotton Bowl and they defeated Fordham in the Cotton Bowl 13 to 12. But, in a sign of things to come, the 1940 Olympic Games were suspended. Originally, they were both, both the Winter Games and the Summer Games were scheduled to be in Japan. <laughs> so they canceled those, tried rescheduling the Winter Olympics for Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Germany invaded Poland in 1935, the Olympic Committee went, oh, this is not going to work. So there were no 1940 Olympic Games. There were also no 1944 Olympic Games. And the first Olympics that were picked up were in 1948. But sports are still very much a part of the, of the culture at this point. The guys have not all been drafted and gone away, as they would very shortly. A lot of footballs, a lot of athletic programs were suspended during the war because there was nobody to play the games. They were all out being soldiers. Gone with the Wind came out in 1939, but it was on everybody's mind in 1940 still. It was, it was the first blockbuster movie, the first really serious blockbuster. Um, you see it won eight Academy Awards, which was absolutely unprecedented at that time. And Hattie McDaniel, who played Mammy, was the first African American to win an Academy Award. She won for Best Supporting Actress. Vivian Lee also won for Best Actress. So Gone with the Wind was very much part of the culture there in 1940. 
Walt Disney is beginning to take hold in the United States. There, uh, the first Walt Disney film was Snow White. Pinocchio was the second one. It came out in 1940. And Fantasia came out in late 1940. And Fantasia was a giant flop. People did not know what to do with this gorgeous thing with all the classical music and the soundtrack. Um, and then the best picture of 1940 was Alfred Hitchcock's movie, Rebecca. And you can almost hear Joan Fontaine saying, last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. It's quite a evocative photograph if you don't know. The plot of, the plot of Rebecca is that Joan Fontaine marries Maxine de Winter, but discovers this creepy, ha creepy um, housekeeper who is still enamored of the first wife, whose name was Rebecca. And so it's very much a psychodrama of Mrs. Danvers, the housekeeper, trying to make the second Mrs. De Winter crazy. And it's all very dramatic. So that was, uh, and I thought this was really interesting because, you know, Disney was winning the box office wars. People were going to see Pinocchio more than they were going to see Rebecca. But they were, the Academy Awards were not going to give the Best Picture Award to Walt Disney. So, um, so Hitchcock got it instead. Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny make their make their debut in 1940, and I, I wish that we could watch this, but it takes a while. It's about it's about eight or nine minutes. It's fairly long, and Bugs Bunny does not actually make his appearance until about three minutes into the film into the cartoon. The first part is Elmer Fudd talking about hunting a wagon. <laughs> but it's just archety I mean it's just archetypal Mooney Tunes because Bugs Bunny finally comes out of his hole and says, What's up, Doc? <laughs> but those are the first words he ever spoke. So this is the beginning of, of an epoch in American popular culture with Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny. Band era, big band era is in full swing in terms of music. Now that's one way the 30s do resemble the 40s. Um, Glenn Miller has two or three. Oh, and we know this because Billboard started tracking the top songs in 1940. So they had their, their first rankings of music in 1940. Um, Glenn Miller had two or three. Marty Shaw. Um, other names that you would recognize there in the popular culture. So, um, I was going to send you guys out with a rendition of In the Mood. I'm not sure. The internet here is swamped because people are using the 1940 census. <laughs> so let's see. Right. <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a shot here. And if not, we can, Jenny will sing it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> please work, please work. <laughs> <laughs> My mom said that um, listening to me sing in the backseat of the car is one of the worst things she's ever heard in her life. <laughs> <laughs> she can't carry a tune. Let's just see if it will um. detail in that series picture about the segregation. Did you notice the magazine cover? True story. It said <laughs> Hitler's love life. Oh, I did see it. that, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm used to really looking at details and I noticed that. That's why I went, was laughing over here and very serious. I just thought that was very interesting. Americans were reading about yeah, Hitler's love life. Picture. Yeah, was Schindler's Love Life revealed? Yeah, there were tabloids <laughs> then too. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Yep. True story. I would have even thought about that. <laughs> Other comments, questions. Where where was Elmer Fudd's weapon? He has no weapon. Oh, he does have a weapon. He's got a rifle. 
Uh, his rifle's not in the picture, but he definitely has that's a rifle. Right. He is not well armed in this picture. Well, yeah, he, uh, Rabbits are not dangerous. <laughs> well, wasn't it the um, man who did the voice for Bugs Bunny did several of the propaganda videos for uh, the U.S. government that they put out? The snap video? No blood. No blood. Yeah, and we have them on the National Archives YouTube channel. There are a couple of those clips with him on there, but he, he narrates them, or is the voice of the different characters. Ours, like <laughs> I don't know. You can tell it's him. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's great stuff. Why not? The National Archives should swing this year. <laughs> Benchmarks in radio in 1940, but it was clearly the medium of choice. But you can't, but when you look at the records for 1940, there's no brand new unveiling of a radio program or anything like that, so I didn't include that. But um, certainly people were spending their time, spending their evenings around. 
turn on their radios when they weren't going to movies. And that's one of the reasons I included movies is because people didn't have a lot of money in the 30s, but they went to the movies. Absolutely. Well, the radio, was, radio was free. I mean, the, and the networks were beginning to split off into multiple networks. Yeah. I'm sure you've noticed in the 30s, the movies are a lot set with wealthy, with wealthy people, with plenty to eat, uh, beautiful clothes. The fantasy, that's what the movies do. Oh, and the clothes were just astonishing, weren't they? The costumes oh, yeah. in the 30s were yeah. yeah. such, yeah. such a fun time. Did the any German American feeling emerge later once we were in the war, or was it starting? I just was curious about. I know by the time the war was going, it was strong, I and mean, we had an incident here with a German American nurse at the war. I don't know. Was out at the, you know, out of the. I don't know when it place. started. I know there was so much residual from World War One. The, you know, for example, the churches. A lot of congregations dropped German language in in the teens, and so by the 40s, there was about the 30s and 40s, there was so much less of that. But I don't know when it started. Does anybody yeah. else have any? I've run across like an architect in Dallas and some others that after World War One, they quit calling themselves German. They would refer to an area. You know, back to the old city state time, you know, yeah. I'm Alsatian or something. Yeah, yeah, no, it was terrible. Yeah. Um, at Baylor, they actually stopped teaching German during mm -hmm. World War One, And I don't know when they reintroduced it to the Greek of the Nino They were going to say something. There was also a severe, you might call it, economic shift from Europe to the United States principally because the magnets had taken over from the lower levels of technology in Europe. Hmm. And for instance, in the case of one of the characters you showed, Winston Churchill's grandfather, apparently was a merchant. Did you uncover any contact he had with his grandfather? I, I, what, I, I just about have told you everything I know about Winston Churchill, so <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't do research on that, but what are you thinking about? Oh, well, apparently quite a few wealthy people married their daughters off. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. To aristocracy. Like the, like the Vanderbilts, Consuelo, mm -hmm. yeah. To aristocracy in England, that's what kept them alive. Yeah. I mean, they still had enormous... Just like Downton Abbey. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They had enormous expenses. Yeah, they oh, yeah. They couldn't afford to make so they got married in order to do it. And that's one of the ways in which Winston Churchill's father separated himself from the wife because he embarrassed well to come over and say to you. We hear a story of Winston Churchill who um, some part estranged from his father for that was the reason. Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the European economy was a mess as a result. I mean, really, I think so much of this we just have to remember. World War One had only ended in nineteen eighteen. There were still families without sons and, and fathers as a result. And, and in case you don't carry the terms of the Treaty of Versailles around on your arm, uh, they were very, very punitive to Germany. Uh, Germany had to admit all of the guilt for the war um, and pay huge sums of reparation as well as giving up land, valuable land, particularly coal lands in Alsace and Lorraine. And Germany defaulted on its reparation payments, which the United States was loaning Germany money to make its reparation payments. And Germany defaulted on that. And that was one of the things that caused the Great Depression, although nobody still seems quite sure of exactly what caused the Great Depression, but that seems to point to it. And of course, you, know, you can't trade with a country that doesn't have any money. So it was just a vast mess. When we talk about uh, ambivalence of uh, such things as the Berlin Lease Program, which sent a lot of ships, naval ships, into war, uh, I'm, I'm quite convinced that communities like Fort Worth and others that relied heavily on defense contracts were glad to see the stimulation of the ability more ships at that point. Uh, there were mm -hmm. people who were eager to, to stay neutral, the United States always tried to save us. 
but uh, you had some people not wanting to go to war and at the same time wanting to work for defense contractors. Well, when did the airline, when did, uh, the, when did the defense industry the, start here? The, it was actually built during the World War II. Yeah, but was I, it like 42, 43? Mm -hmm. I was thinking Fort Worth Warrior in a hypothetical situation. It's yeah. coastal areas mm -hmm. like Los Angeles that are just moving with ship. Absolutely, but, but, the, but the airplanes came yeah. later. Right. And, yeah. and every time I was there, they built the Liberator Village for the workers to live in, the daycare centers. Well, George Bush's uncle had quite a bit to do with it because he was sort of consistent to the CIA that was being developed. Out of St. Louis, he pretty much with the context of all the military expenses and developed a great deal of under power, not in the government. That continues to have an impact on Fort Worth today. It seems like you can't open the paper without seeing an article about Lockheed. Mm -hmm. Matters very heavy. Right. What else? Mm -hmm. Anyone else have questions? Mm -hmm. All right. So, no other questions. Um, first off, my name is Preston Huff, and I'm the regional liaison, or forget that title, I'm the senior person here at Fort Worth, and make it a little easier. Um, on behalf of the National Archives, I'd like to give us a token of appreciation. It's a book about all regions, and it draws on images from, you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the South to Canada, from our holdings. It's very visual, but very historic. And, uh, uh, it includes several images in here from our region as well. So, as a token of appreciation, thank you. Thank you. As we say, that that'll teach. Yeah. <laughs>